Thank you, John. Remember the body and blood of Jesus Christ with the piece of bread and the cup. Fruit of the vine that reminds us of his blood. The word for tonight to examine ourselves is help. Help. To give or provide what is necessary to accomplish a task or satisfy a need. Contribute strength or means to render assistance to. Cooperate efficiently with, aid or assist, help. <laughs> Psalms 121, I lift up my eyes to the mountain. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. So tonight, as we examine ourselves, just think about where does your help come from? Psalms 46, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Ever-present help. John 14, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. You see, we have this helper, the Holy Spirit, that resides in us. That's our advocate. That's our helper. Isaiah 41. So do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you and my, with my righteous right hand. Amen. Hallelujah. Where does our help come from? The Lord, right? Woo. <laughs> a piece of bread and a cup that reminds us of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And just to reminisce a little bit about Jesus. You know, he came from heaven. He was with God from the beginning. And he came down and resided in flesh. The word, God's word says the word became flesh. Jesus, the word, became flesh and dwelt among us. And that's one of the tests for a false doctrine is to say he came in the flesh. Because there are doctrines that don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh. And he dwelt among us. That's kind of interesting when you think about it. And what else did he do? He did so many things that we can't even recount them all. It also says in the Word that they couldn't all be wrote down because it would just be way too much. So... Just a little bit of help. <laughs> yeah. Funny how that fits in, isn't it? Thank you, Father, for being our helper. Thank you for sending an advocate, a helper, that helps us always in our constant time of need and in troubling times, Father. For truly we can see this day and age that things are not getting better. Things are getting worse. So the time is growing near when Jesus will return, when the trumpet will sound, and we meet you in the air. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father, for a piece of bread and a cup that so fittingly reminds us of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, that we can remember it Night after night after night, Father. Thank you, Father, for giving us a physical way to remember the body and the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So strengthen us tonight, Father, as we meet together, as we take of the Lord's Supper. 
bread and cup. Encourage us while we're together, Father. May we spiritually be united as we take of bread and cup, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's take of the bread. And let's take of the cup. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Let's just begin in verse 1 and kind of just read on down. I know we covered verse 1 down through about verse 3 or 4 last week. Really good. Hebrews 4, beginning in verse 1, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Amen. And that's just something to pause on. You know, when you hear the word of God, you've got to mix it with what? Faith. If you don't mix the word with faith, you got nothing. And you're going to hear some other word coming up here. One more word, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, in there is presented as labor or work. Okay. And so those things together, uh, the word not mixed with faith and faith not mixed with is what? dead dead amounts to nothing it's just dead so you got to have those three things in action okay as you receive the word for we which have believed do enter into rest as he said i have sworn in my wrath they shall enter into my rest although the works were finished from the foundation of the world and what that basically means is this He's reinforcing what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, For it is by grace that you have been saved, not by lest any man can. And in Ephesians chapter 1, it says that before the foundation of the world, God set all this in motion. He took care of it all. So it's already the foundation is laid, the price is paid, um, and the way is made. You know, for, for rest to be something that we can enter into spiritually, morally, emotionally, um, physically. I mean, there, there's just, it's, it's a total rest, but it requires first, the word, second, faith, and third, effort on your part. Okay? Even though... Yes, God's already made it done. He's taken care of it. He says that doesn't exempt you from the effort. You're not, you're not making the effort to, to you know, obtain grace or to obtain anything. You're making the effort. The word is here to enter into, right? To enter into. You know, if I told you that there was a million dollars in the bank downtown and I gave you the address to the bank, and I told you when it was going to be open, and I told you that you had to be there at a certain time, and I told you that you had to go and present a certain account number to a certain teller, and then they would open up the vault and give you a million dollars. Guess what you have to do? 
No, for, yeah. first off, you have to listen to the words I just said. Next, you have to put faith that what I just said was absolutely true. Next, you got to put effort into it and go and carry out every single detail that I just said. Right? Hmm. Simple. Easy. You don't have to question where the million dollars come from. That's what most people want to do. They want to question what God, they want to question where, how did all this happen? Where did it come from? How, you know, what did we, I don't understand grace. I don't understand mercy. I don't understand this love. I don't understand why I have to do it this way. They want to question all of that rather than just saying, there's a million bucks and all I got to do is this. Huh. Done. You mean there's eternity and all I got to do is this. There's forgiveness. All I got to do is this. There's healing. All I got to do is this. There's blessing and all I got. Yeah, that's it. Don't, don't try to, but see, everybody likes to try and question all the other things, you know. They want to validate it first. Well, can I get the phone number to the bank? I like to call down there first and make sure there really is a million dollars there. That's what people want to do right now. They'd love for God to give them a number. They can call heaven and find out if it's real. <laughs> Just give me the number to somebody who's there so I can know that it's real, you know. Give me the number of somebody. I want two references. Give me the number to somebody who's in hell so I can know it real too. You know, that way I've got both ends covered. I got it figured out. Okay, now I'm going to walk by faith. <laughs> Just, you know, got to have two references, you know, so. <laughs> hmm. Verse four, for he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. I love how vague the, the apostle is here in his writing. Someplace, someplace I remember that it's written, God rested. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, you know, he's having a senior moment or something, you know. Come on. <laughs> it, there was just some humor. That's all that, that, you know, even the apostles had a sense of humor, you know. Somewhere, somewhere, for he spake in a place of the seventh day, you know, on this wise. And God did rest on the seventh day from all of his work. And in this place again, if they enter into my rest, hmm. I love Peterson's paraphrase here. He says, but in this other text, he says, they'll never be able to sit down and rest. Hmm. You know, God says in, in, in one place, you know, it says that, you know, I labored six and I rested, but God also, <laughs> he immediately knew that one of our greatest was to be able to enter into the rest and then rest. Doesn't do any good to enter into the rest if once you enter into the rest, you're just going to worry about, you know, I don't know, resting. Which so many people do. Oh, this is so great to rest, but how long is this going to keep up? You know, I don't know if we can just, can we just rest here all the time? Is this really going to work? You know, and they're, I mean, they're just a worry mess the whole time that they're supposed to be resting and they're worrying about or all the things that aren't getting done. You know, it's just, God says, you know, they'll never be able to sit down and rest. Seeing therefore, it remaineth that some must enter in and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, the word there is uh, probably more clearly defined as disobedience. Disobedience. You know, you can go and, and just research the word Sabbath throughout Scripture and throughout the Old Testament, and you'll find one of the things, especially prophetically written in the book of Isaiah, is that God would mention over and over again how that they had polluted their Sabbath by doing what they wanted to do. In other words, doing their own thing. Go to, go to us if you want to. Go to the book of Isaiah. I think it's chapter 58. And uh, look at verse 12. It says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, 
Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called uh, the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. That all sounds great, doesn't it? Huh? I mean, we, we kind of talked about a lot of those repairing the waste on Sunday. You know, the beauty for ashes and all of those things that God came to do. Look at this verse 13 now. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine old words. There was a lot of vine in there, wasn't it? There was a lot of your way. And God says, you know, it is, it, the whole Sabbath thing is about first learning how to surrender your will to his will. Not my will be done, your will be done, without question. See, and if you want to enter into rest, rest isn't about a Sabbath day. Even blessed are you, though, when you honor and rest on a day. Whatever day you want to pick, pick one. God works six. All right, there's no reason for you to work seven. Some of you work in seven and, and you're, str you're still not making ends meet. You're still not getting everything done. You're still just distressed. So, you know, why not just do it in six? Take that one, honor God, and watch things change. See, that's the part people don't understand. If you'll start honoring God in the, every area of your life, without question, things will change. It's amazing that even in, in, in the financial realm, if you want to see a change in your financial realm, God, realm, God says, stop robbing me. Give me what is mine and see if I won't open up the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing you can't contain it. But the robbing there in Malachi 3 was, there was a whole lot of robbing going on. It just wasn't that they weren't given the tithe, but they also weren't living righteously in their lives. They were, they were doing part of what God said. They were twisting around what God said to make it fit their own pleasures. And God says, I'm not happy with that. Stop robbing me. Let's get back to giving me. In other words, doing the things in absolute obedience. And then now, guess what happens? It's a four-letter word. Guess what happens? What? What? Starts with an R. Ah. <laughs> yeah, when you do what God wants, then there's rest in your life. If you're living God's way morally, there's rest. If you're living God's way um, in marriage, we talked a little bit about that Sunday, you know, husbands be husbands, wives be wives. And, and you know, and that means the husbands, you know, they love their wives as Christ loved the church, right? And then wives, you submit and honor your husband and revere him, you know? And, and, and when you do those things, no matter how hard it is, guess what there is in your marriage? Yeah, there will be rest. You won't be at each other's throats. You won't be fussing and fighting and nicking and picking and all that kind of stuff. There will be peace in your house. There will be peace in your relationship when you just say, wait a second, my role is to love my wife like Christ loves me. And I want to ask you, what end is there to that? None. There is no end to it. You just keep on going. Christ, aren't you glad he don't ever get to the place where he says, no, I'm done with you. Right? And so we love our, we love our wives we pre, and, and we cover our wives. We do that which God has called us to do as men, you know. And then the next thing is the, the women honor their husbands the same way that we're supposed to honor God and honor Christ and fear him, you know, and submit. That's the other word. We don't like that. Ooh, you know, submit. But the, the preceding verse to both of those things, talking about husbands and wives is, and the, the preceding verse before it is, is submit yourselves therefore unto Christ. So the wife has to be submitted. The man has to be submitted unto Christ. And when the husband and the wife are submitted unto Christ, well, then the man has no problem doing what he's supposed to do. And the wife has no problem doing what she's supposed to do. And there is rest in the family. <laughs> it's that simple. It's that simple. You don't believe
I dare you to try it. <laughs> dare you to try it. You got some financial issues? My question would be, are you tired? But once I get my finances straight, I will. That's not how it works. Okay? You tithe and you watch God work things out. Because you're going to honor him. You're going to submit to him. You're going to work. Because where's the faith? If you want to get your finances now where tithing is no big deal, where's your faith? Notice what this hinges on over here is that you got to take the word and mix it with what? Ah. And then take the word and mix faith and then mix it with effort. That means you got to be diligent. You got to set up this budget and say, okay, look, we earn this much money this week. We're going to take 10% out of that. And that goes immediately unto God. Immediately unto God. See, there's, there's you take, and, and you're going, but I don't know how we're going to make it because we're going to need that by the time we get down here. I guarantee you, by the time you, you take that in obedience and give him his, his tithe, his 10%, and you give that unto the Lord out of obedience, in faith, you're mixing the word and the faith, and then you make the effort and you do it. Watch what will happen. Within just a few weeks, you'll be going, I don't understand how we got so much money in our bank account. I don't know how we're paying our bills on this amount of money, but we're paying our bills on this amount of money. Because that's who God is. That's who God is. And you'll have rest. Here's how it'll work. You, you, and I'm only telling you because I know how it works, okay? Because I've been through it and I know. You know, when you come up, when, you, when you're like looking at something financially and you're like, I don't know how, I'm gonna, how that's going to happen, you know, used to, you know, be like, okay, well, I got to do something. I need to go pick up an extra side job. I got to go, you know, sell something. I got to go do, I got to go, you know, right? Get a line of credit or something because I don't know how that's going to work. Well, that's your unbelief. And that's robbing you of your rest because now you're worried. Well, part of this is that also the scripture says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things through prayer and supplication, make your request known unto God and a peace that passes all understanding will be yours. Amen? And, and that's in all things at all times. You know, so when you can't see how it's all going to come together, I, you will spend less time worrying. I used to worry. I used to lay asleep at night. I used to worry about how we were going to, you know, uh, pay the rent or, or you know, make, make, you know, the mortgage or, or pay for the car or whatever. Just, you know, you just sit awake at night. How do you work all those things out? And to get to a place in your life where you can just, just trust God because you know you're obedient to him and rest in it and know that he's going to meet and supply no matter what. You know, and, 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 and in here, there's a rest. There's a peace. We're used to, in here, you're just like, you know, you're looking at everybody else going, oh, it's okay. It's okay. God's got this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> losing sleep at night. No, God changes all that when you become obedient in what you're supposed to do. In living for him. Okay, so this this works. This idea of rest. This is not just about Sabbath day. This is about righteousness. And you'll understand that when we get to the end of the passage, you'll understand, wait a second, he's talking a whole lot more than just Sabbath day, even though he is talking Sabbath day, but he's also talking obedience and belief and faith and mixing that with the word. And every if I do that in every area of my life, there's going to be a huge turnaround in my life. And I'll be able to walk out what God says. God says, Jesus said, look, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough worry of its own. Right? Well, how do you get to a place when you're not going to worry about tomorrow because tomorrow's got enough worry of its own? Well, the verses leading up to that said, why do you worry about where you're going to lay your head, where, what clothes you're going to wear, and what food you're going to put in your belly? He goes, you can't serve two masters. You must choose who you're going to serve. You'll either serve the God of this world or you'll serve the God of heaven. He goes, he cares for the birds of the air. He kills for, cares for the lilies of the valley and the grass of the field. None of those things get up and labor and toil and soul, but they're all just, they just get up and do. They just get up and exist throughout the day and do what God's created them to do. He goes, your heavenly father loves you even more. Much, much more than them, he says. He goes, so... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this other stuff that the pagans chase after that everybody else out there is, you know, going crazy to figure out and worrying about. He says, 
Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And he goes, and all these other things will be added unto you. Wow. So don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow's got enough worry of its own. Let's focus on the mission at hand today. That's rest. When you're living in the moment, when you're living in the now, when you're living in this is where I'm at with God right now, when you're, when you're soaking in this and just saying, okay, God, I'm, I'm living for today. I'm living for right now because I don't even know if you're going to be here tomorrow because you might come back tomorrow and I don't have to worry about tomorrow. What good is it for me to worry about storing up treasure for tomorrow because I don't know if I'm going to be here tomorrow. I'm worried about today. The only tomorrow I'm worried about is the tomorrow if I spend it in eternity with him. That's the only tomorrow that I have any control over is I'm going to spend, if, if tomorrow doesn't come, am I going to be in heaven or am I going to be in hell? That I have control over that destiny. And I'm going to tell you what, one is going to be a place of perfect rest and one is going to be an eternal torment in hell. You think you got worries now? You think you got problems now? You think you got drama going on in your life now? Die and go to hell without Jesus. And you'll live that cycle for all eternity with no hope of it ever changing. Wow. All right. Oh, yeah, let's finish 14 there in 58 of Isaiah. It says, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. Oh, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord when I'm not worried about mine, 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 right? When you're not stuck in verse 13, you can be stuck in verse 14. Delighting yourself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father for the mouth of the Lord huh, said what? He spoke it because God said so. So you take that word, you mix it with faith and you walk it out. Get over yourself, verse 13. That's what that means. Get over yourself, verse 13, so you can walk in verse 14. Hmm. All right. Back to Hebrews chapter 4. Where were we? Glad somebody was following along. I wasn't. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. In other words, he's saying it in the Psalms. David wrote this. David spoke this years ago prophetically, as it is written by David. If we listen to what God is saying and don't harden our hearts to it. See, that's what that means is this tonight, no matter how much you like or don't like what was just spoken, if you won't harden your heart, but you grab a hold of it, You'll see a change. You'll see the change you've been looking for. You'll see the change you've been longing for. You'll find rest and peace such as you've never known because it'll be in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean there aren't going to be any bumps and there aren't going to be any adversities and there aren't going to be any struggles because there will be. Because guess what? The devil wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your peace and he wants to steal your rest. And if he can keep you chasing the proverbial carrot, then you'll never rest. He just keeps dangling in front of your nose. And by the time you get there, whoa, you know. And so many people buy into it. It's time as the church here, guys. And the problem with Israel back in the day was they couldn't be satisfied with the things of God. They also wanted the things of the world. The Bible declares a house divided against itself cannot stand. You can't chase after the world and chase after God. Make your choice. Which one are you going to chase after? Once you make that choice, wow, things begin to get real easy, simplified. Hmm. Okay. Harden not your hearts. Verse 8, for if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Hmm. In other words, he says, this, this, this is an ongoing opportunity. This is something, you know what, we keep getting it wrong, and Jesus keeps giving an opportunity to get it right. Praise God. <laughs> you know, that's why he's the great high priest. This is why in a few verses it's going to fit really well in your mind why it says he was tempted in all ways just as we are yet without sin. 
In other words, this whole idea of surrendering yourself, your will, your way, your wants, your desires, your needs, your whatever that's keeping you from really doing what God wants you to do and, and being obedient, walking in obedience with your finances, obedience with your marriage, obedience with your, your children, obedience you know, in your, in your uh, spiritual life, obedience in every area. The reason that you know, it, he's saying, look, I, I'm here. I'm going to simplify this for you. I'm, I'm the great high priest. I know what it's like to walk this out. You know, even I had to pray in the garden and cry unto my father, if you can take this cup from me, please. But father, not my will, but yours be done. And to the cross he went. Notice this immediately when he's done praying that prayer, he goes back to his disciples and immediately the Judas, Judas comes and it's the hour of the betrayal. The greatest hour of Jesus is testing and Jesus' walk and Jesus' mission that he came to fulfill on this earth started the minute that he surrendered his will to the Father. Then did he experience that heartache of betrayal as Judas kissed him. Then, then he felt the heartache as he was falsely accused and no one stood by his side. The heartache as he could look into Peter's eyes and the cock crowed three times. And Peter said, I don't know him. As he was taken from that council chambers and delivered into the hands of Roman uh, uh, guards to be whipped and beaten and the flesh torn from his body and him to be made a public mockery and, 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 and just uh, be scorned publicly the way that he was. He walked through all of that. He said, I did that so you could continue to have an opportunity to step out of unbelief and disobedience into a life of faith and rest through Jesus. That's the power of what he's saying. He goes, I understand your, your, your inability. I understand your human weakness, but Jesus. Amen? I mean, that's the Apostle Paul in Romans 7. He says, my human weakness, but Jesus. That, that's, that's Romans 7. If you ever want to just paraphrase Romans 7, my human weakness, but Jesus. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> See, we could just shorten the Bible right down to a few pages and it would be just so, you know, really easy people to get. Verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. That's a promise. There remains a rest to the people of God. Enter into it, folks. I'm telling you what, just start entering into everything that God said to do and then for the areas in which you fail, there's Jesus. For the times you fail, there's Jesus. Jesus isn't your crutch. Jesus isn't an enabler. Jesus isn't there so you can just kind of live willy-nilly doing what you want to and not putting any effort. No, it's when you put the effort in and you come up short, even though you put the effort in, and, and you keep, keep falling and stumbling just a little bit. Praise God, there's Jesus. You know, because, you know, the law... <laughs> It illuminated in uh, the way, in the pathway to righteousness, but it also illuminated uh, and, um, our inability and our weakness. And it says there in Romans that it gave power to sin, to rule and reign over us. But there's Jesus. Jesus came to set us free from sin. Jesus came to set us free from that curse. And Jesus came to make right and take away the condemnation for when we fail according to the law. Jesus says, no, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who don't chase after the things of the flesh, but who run after the things of the Spirit. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is a good passage of Scripture. I'm telling you, this is awesome. If you're not enjoying it, I am. This is, this is good. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Oh, let's, let's read that again. For he, 
That's you and me. That's a, that's a, a word of opportunity because anybody can become the he. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his as God did from his own. Hmm. If we enter into God's ways, enter into, you know, when Jesus says, I am the way, right? We don't have to go any further, just I am the way. So he's showing you the way to enter into the rest, when we follow that pattern, later in Hebrews, you know, we'll, if you will hear that, it says that we're supposed to lay aside the weight of sin that does so easily beset us, and we are supposed to, you know, cast our eyes upon Jesus, who is the author and the finisher, who's already set the pattern and run the race, and we just get to follow therein. Huh. You mean it's not even that hard to figure out how to do this? No, because Jesus set down the pattern. Praise God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. I guess the question would be, are, have you ceased from trying to do this your own way? That's what that means. You've ceased from trying to do this your own way. You, you're, you're ceased, you've ceased from, you know, debating with the Spirit of God about what did exactly He mean there. You've ceased from debating with me. Don't come up to me after church. Well, now, Pastor, do you, do you, do you really think we should take a Sabbath or not? You know, are we, are we really supposed to follow into the rest? I mean, what, what is rest? You know, I mean, obviously you haven't ceased from your own works yet. So you just go on about your thing, okay? Because that's that's the you know that's a conversation that's not really a conversation because you're not seeking truth. You're seeking validation for what you're doing so that you can continue to do what you're doing by trying to poke holes in what the word just said. The word just said it, so let's just let's just follow that and praise God, <laughs> things will be good. Cease from your own works as God did from his own works. Let us labor, therefore. Boy, this is just a, I love it. He calls us to rest. Now he wants us to labor. <laughs> Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. In other words, this is going to, this is going to take effort on your part to make it happen. And I'll just give you a, a, just a true-to-life example, okay? When I mention Sabbath day, and I get so much kickback from people. That's the law. That's Old Testament. You're leading us into bondage. No, no, no. No, I'm not leading you into bondage any more than God led them into would God did, did God speak that to lead his people into bondage? Or would God speak that in that time so he could say, look, you will now experience my blessings when you walk according to my ways and you live this way. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed. Your, your livestock's going to be blessed. Your, 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 the land you're on and the crops you plant, they're going to be blessed. The people that work for you, they're going to be blessed. Why? Because there's rest in the land. You know, he, he didn't do it to lead them into bondage. He did these things to lead them into liberty and to life. But everybody wants to think, like, they, they look at it as bondage. I'm like, no, no, that's the devil. He's working against it. He likes to take the word and twist it and make liberty look like, you know, bondage and bondage look like liberty. Hmm. So, you know, he says, look, you know, we've got to get to the point where we labor. In other words, hear what God says and make the honest effort to make it happen. So like Sabbath day, I'm going to tell you what, when we first got the revelation about Sabbath day, Okay. I'm going to tell you what, man, we, we, as a family, that was exhausting. It was exhausting to tell your flesh, no, we're resting today. 
I can remember so many little family conversations, you know, amongst ourselves and with the kids. So what exactly can we and can we not do on the Sabbath day? Is it okay to do this? Is it okay to do that? Is it okay to do this? Can I read a book? Can I do it? You know, I'm just like, ah, you know, <laughs> right? So when we, when we get this and we understand this and, we, and we're like, hey, okay, this is going to take a lot of effort. We had to set the pattern. We had to be intentional about what we were going to do. And then we had to stick to it. Are you listening? You got to set the pattern. You got to stick to it. Okay, day of rest, day of rest, period. Then we had to sit down and figure out what day that was going to be for us. Okay, because again, I'm not, I'm not into telling you guys what day it is for you. God didn't say what day it was. He just said he worked sick and rested one. So let's work six and rest one. Pick one. I don't care which one it is. Whatever works for you, pick that one. And, and it's not a day to catch up on your honeydews and your whatevers and, you know, do your DIY projects and all that kind of stuff. No, it's a time to rest. There you go. And it doesn't have to involve church. Matter of fact, it shouldn't involve church because the one complaint about church is I don't get any rest. Yeah, you know, oh, I had to get up early today, Pastor. Yeah. Then I got to sit in here and listen to you talk for two hours and I'm getting tired by the moment, you know. I just want to go home and yeah, everybody wants a nap on Sunday. You know, so after we go and do all this busy stuff Sunday morning, we squeeze a nap into Sunday afternoon, and then we try really hard to make it back to Sunday night church, and there is no rest in that. But we'll call that Sabbath day, and we'll call that our day of rest. And I'm like, that is not rest. Pick a day and do what God said. Yeah. Takes a whole lot of effort. See, we like to put church in the middle of the Sabbath day because it makes it feel right to us. Well, no, because it looks holy. Uh, see, we included God in it. So just because you put God in it, don't make it right. And it doesn't even mean God's in it. Just because you put his name there doesn't mean he's there. That's not how that works. So we got to labor to enter in. It takes effort to tithe. It takes discipline to do that and discipline to set your budget up and say, okay, it takes this. There's another part of the uh, Bible talks all about money. A lot of times it says, oh man, no, no man, anything, right? Boy, that takes effort to live this life without owing any man, anything. Oh, well, pastor, that's unreasonable. You know, I got to have a mortgage. No, you don't. Oh, I got to have a car and that requires a, no, no, you don't. You want a car and you want a mortgage, but do you need it? Let's get right down to the nitty gritty of it all. No, you don't need either one. Can you live with both? Oh, yes, you can. Well, pastor, I need air conditioning. No, no, you don't. <laughs> I mean, again, let's get down to the truth of it all. You know, it's there, there's, there's, you know, he said, oh man, no, no, no man, anything. And yet we owe people for all of those things all the time. I love the looks on your face. It's great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Say what? And then what will you do for those things? Oh, what would you do for a Klondike bar? <laughs> Forget the Klondike buy. We'll do just about anything for air conditioning, a mortgage, and a nice car. Sell our soul to the devil. Oh, did he say Yeah, he just said that. Yeah. I tell people all the time, they're like, Pastor, I, I just need work. And I'm like, no, you need Jesus. No, I need to get a job. I can get my act together. No, you need Jesus. You know? And, and they'll come to church, and they'll be like, oh, man, getting into church, getting into church. And then they'll get a job. I'm like, oh, you got a job. Yeah. Well, make sure that you have, you know, Sundays and Wednesdays off so you can come to church. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I told my, told my boss. He said he'd do that for me. I said, <laughs> okay, I'll give you a week. And that's just about how long they make it with that. Because in about a week or maybe two weeks, all of a sudden, oh, uh, you know, I got to work. He said, I can't have every Sunday. Got to work at least one. Oh, and they're paying double time. And I really, you know, but pastor, <laughs> I'll tithe. <laughs> Amazing how we put God in that. Right? And then they walk away from, you know, they're no longer consistent in church. And now all of a sudden, even though they can't see it, their spiritual life's going like this. 
But hey, their financial life's going like this, but their spiritual life's going like that. My question is, what's more important? Air conditioning, nice car, and a house, or your eternal soul in heaven or hell? <laughs> it's amazing how few people are like, you know, absolutely certain of which one of those they want to choose, you know? And yet Jesus said, he goes, if your eye, you know, if your eye offends you and is going to leave you and throw you, you know, going to put you into hellfire, he goes, better for you to go in through life with one eye than to go into hell with two. He goes, if your right hand offends you, he goes, cut it off because it's better for you to go into right life with one hand than to go into hell with two. Right? And that's extreme. Yes, that's extreme. But he's trying to get Jesus. Those are the words of Jesus. Don't look at me like I'm an idiot, okay? Or like I'm some, that's, that's, that's Jesus. He preached that sermon to the people, okay? That's what he said. So, you know, he's trying to get the extreme across to you that, hey, what is it that's going to be the hang up that at the end of the time when you stand before Jesus and you'll stand there and that'll be the one thing that keeps you out of heaven? What's it going to be? Or are you willing to, Labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. See, the question would be is, do you believe God can provide for you? Do you believe God can heal you? Do you believe God can sustain you? Do you believe God will meet and supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus or not? Because see, the children, as they wandered through the wilderness, Israel, God sustained all their needs. They didn't, he said, if you'll, if you'll commit your way unto me, and if you'll follow all my commandments and all my statutes, I won't allow any disease or sickness or plague to come upon you. I will be the God that healeth thee. Wait a minute, he just promised you the best medical plan ever on planet earth. That not only would he heal you, but you won't even have to worry about the healing because in his book, the healing is none of that stuff comes nigh your dwelling place. It's like one of the first promises that he made to the people after they came out of Egypt. They've just started the journey and God says that. And he had just performed one of them, you know, well, if, if the Red Sea wasn't already an amazing, you know, miracle. But they came to a place where there was bitter water and they couldn't drink it and they were thirsty. And so, you know, God said, hey, you know, put your stick in the water and all of a sudden I'll make the water sweet. And he made the water sweet. So he demonstrated his power, then made a promise of better things than that were on the horizon. If you'll just follow all my statutes and commandments, then I will be this God for you. I will heal you, deliver you, sustain you, shelter you, and cover you so that sickness doesn't even come close to you ever. <sighs> then he was the God that, that fed them with manna. He was the God that gave them water from a rock. He was the God that met, and that what would they do? They would grumble and complain and whine and look back at what the, what the gods of Egypt provided for them, what their slave masters and taskmasters provided for them, and said, oh, life was so much better back then. We'd rather be there than here. God has brought us out here to kill us and to, and to cause us to die here in this place. So it comes down to belief or unbelief, and what are you going to labor for? Because notice, God never gave them any more manna than what they needed for when? One day. Don't put it in. Then he goes, and for those that thought they were going to store it up, it turned into worms and mold the next day. They couldn't eat it. He only provided today. But they were never satisfied. Would just stepping out your door and getting bread and being fed. Roll your lazy behind out of bed and just go pick up the bread. And you want to grumble against God. 
I mean, he did, he did miraculous things to demonstrate. And, and, and guess what? What if they had just done what he said? Guess what they were going to enter into? What, Pastor, you mean they... God said, if a man don't work, he don't eat. Hmm. Well, they still had to walk out the door. They still had to go and collect the manna from off the ground. And then they, they took the manna, and it was, it was something they described like, like coriander seed is the description in scriptures, and they would grind it and knead it into a bread and eat it. Does that sound like labor and effort? I, I tell you all day long, I can tell you, it's better to work one day in God's kingdom than to work 10 days in the kingdom of this world. I'm going to tell you right now. All right? The scripture actually makes it bigger than that. He says better is one day in his courts than a thousand days in other places. Huh. And, and, and for the human mind and for the mind that's been conditioned to conforming to the pattern of this world, Romans 12 too, it's hard to comprehend any of what I just said. But when you allow the word of God to come unto you, like it said tonight, and then you take that word and you mix it with faith, all of a sudden there's a transformation that begins to take place in here. So that what looks and sounds like a, a irrational and impossible, all of a sudden becomes, there's nothing impossible with my God. You'll find yourself walking and living in supernatural ways that before you don't even know how you, that, that looked like, you know, just absolute impossibility. Tithing, you, you'll be struggling with tithing a 10% today and you'll be given 95% in about a year from now. I just said that, yes. You'll be just like 10%? Huh! It's all his anyway. You know, he, he says, give me 10 and I'll loan you 90. You know? And, and if you learn to live on God's percent versus your 90%, because, man, we'll give God his 10 and we'll hold on to that 90 till we're white-knuckled, man. It'd be like, I only got 90 left. Oh. If you're going to live that way, please don't give God your 10 if you're gonna if you're gonna like put a stranglehold on the nine left you, and you, you're not gonna have joy, and you're gonna stress over the ten that you gave him, and at the end of the at the end of the week or the end of the month or the end of the day, you're gonna look at the ten and so say, if only I'd have had that, I'd have made it this month. You're better off not giving God anything because you put a stranglehold on that ninety. You should look and say, praise God, he gave me, I mean, 90% of what God wants to bless you with. What if you looked at everything that you get in your life as 90% God gave you? Here you go. This is 90% of God's blessings in my life right now. And see what God wants you to do with it. Man, I'm going to tell you what. You want to talk about rest. You start living that way, just emotional Physical, spiritual, rest. Just rest. You'll be just so not even, but it takes effort. It takes labor into it. Let us, therefore, labor to enter into the rest. Hmm. Because the opposite of that is, lest any man fall after the same examples of unbelief. So there's your question tonight. What is it you're ready to do? Labor for the kingdom? I promise you right now, it's better than anything else you're ever going to do in your entire life. Or are you going to continue down the road of doubt and unbelief trying to do things your way? There is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death and destruction. Hmm. Father God, tonight I, I thank you, God, for this amazing, powerful, life 
changing word that you have spoken, breathed right into us tonight, God. And we have to choose now, what are we going to do? Are we going to lay hold on it and say, yes, Lord, I want to be at rest with you no matter what it costs. No matter what I have to give up, no matter what I have to surrender, no matter how much pride (laughs) I have to swallow, no matter how much humble pie I have to eat, no matter how much forgiveness I have to ask for, I'm going to submit even when I don't like it. I'm going to love even when I don't want to. I'm going to walk in obedience to your word even when I don't understand it. I choose to live by faith and not to walk in unbelief and disobedience with you, Father. I won't rest. I won't rest. Father, also we we acknowledge, God, our, our human weakness, God, tonight, that we can't do this on our own. And I'm so glad that you knew that way in advance of us, God, and you sent Jesus as God in the flesh to overcome the curse of sin and the law and to make perfect the law and defeat sin. To take off of us shame and condemnation and guilt and to give us life and liberty peace through jesus thank you thank you so much father tonight i i pray for every person right now listening in this room and those listening online god who know without a doubt that tonight is a night in which they need to surrender and labor to enter into a relationship of rest with you. Father, for those that need, know that they need that their first effort, their first act of labor is going to be laying aside their, their pride and laying aside their themselves completely and stepping into the waters of baptism for the first time and to become a new creation in Christ Jesus tonight, God. That's a labor in and of itself, Father, just to humble ourselves and say, yes, I want to be obedient and to enter into a restful, peaceful relationship with God through Jesus because I know that He alone is the way, the truth, the life, and no man can have a relationship with God without Jesus. So, Father God, I pray for every person right now in the line and in this room who needs to do that and make that effort. God, I pray that tonight will be the night they do so. God, I pray for others in the room, God, who need to surrender uh, finances tonight. They need to quit making excuses for why they're not tithing and to begin to tithe right now. They're not just going to give their little bits. They're not going to give their two little mites or whatever it is, and they're going to tithe because that's what you've asked for. That's the first, that's the starting point, God. And it's going to be a labor. It's going to be a struggle. And they're going to have to be diligent about it, God, and be intentional, God. And But tonight, God, I pray for those that need to commit themselves in that area, Lord God, and that they will be faithful. And God, I pray that as they're faithful, there'll be so much just peace and rest with you and peace and rest in their finances, God. That there will be a load of worry and weight just lifted off of them, God, because they're being obedient to you. Father, I pray for others, God, that are struggling in in maybe their marriage today, God. Um, And it's because they're, first of all, they need to come under submission to you, under Christ Jesus as head, and that everything he says in the word is exactly how they're supposed to live as a husband or as a wife. And they're going to lay aside, God, all the things in their lives that are making them not be a good husband or a good wife tonight, God, and surrender totally and be in submission, most importantly, God, to you, and then in submission, God, as a husband and a wife to one another. 
God, I pray that they lay it all down tonight, Lord. And I pray for peace in their marriages, God. I pray for rest in their marriages, God. I pray for blessing in their marriages, God, as they lay it down at your feet, Lord. Father, there's other people struggling, God, with just committing unto you, God, the hours of their day. They're, they're still chasing after their wants, their desires, their pleasures. And the area they need to commit to, God, is, is Sabbath rest. God, help them to labor into that by picking a day and being faithful to the day and, and not letting anything steal away the day. And God, I pray that you'll strengthen them, God, that you'll gird them and, 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 and just uh, give the host of heaven, God, uh, just an encampment all around them as, God, they're going to be pressed in on every side to violate the commitment to the Sabbath day. But God, I pray that you'll strengthen them in that commitment that they will honor you. And God, I pray that there will just be an abundant blessing that happens in their, in their homes, in their health, in their mental uh, uh, and emotional state, God, that they'll have peace of mind. Their bodies will come into alignment physically, Lord. And I pray for just a, just a complete just blessing, God, a Sabbath blessing to come upon their homes and their, and their, and their physical bodies, Father, in their, their minds. And also, God, a, a, a refreshing spiritually, Lord, Oh, God, I just thank you and praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, God. Whew. Hallelujah. If you're listening right now and anything that I've prayed over right now, maybe it's baptism and you need to labor into that tonight and just step into the water and quit, quit you know, making excuses or resisting or whatever it is that you keep using as the thing. Um, and just surrender and come and just experience rest in the water. <laughs> your, your soul is going to be at rest. Your spirit is going to be at rest. Your, your, man, I'll tell you what, there's going to be a weight lifted off of you tonight. Just come, come. If you have one of the other issues and you're not coming for baptism, but you have one of those, there's some other areas in your life and you know you need to surrender it, um, what I want you to do is, um, if you have, maybe it's Sabbath, maybe it's tithing, maybe it's your marriage, whatever it is, I want you to come up front and I want you just to kneel up here someplace. I want you to kneel. And, and, and that's it. That'll be your act. That's your thing. You got to get out of your seat and come and kneel and say, okay, God, I'm surrendering this to you right now tonight. Maybe it's your future. Maybe it's your job. You, you're, you're, you, you've known God's called you out of something, but you're like holding on to it just tight-fisted because you're afraid Whew. because you can't, you can't see how tomorrow's going to work if you're not in control of it and you need to surrender tomorrow to the hands of God tonight and labor into that rest with Him. You're, you're a worrier. You're always worrying about tomorrow. And God said, don't worry about tomorrow. And you need to come and get on your knees and receive a peace that passes all understanding tonight. So as we sing this last song, I want you guys to make decisions. Whatever it is tonight, just come and make your decisions tonight as we sing this song. Stand to your feet.
Wrap your arms around her, God, and let her know how much you love her. She's your daughter. Mm. She has the promise of heaven. She has the gift of the Holy Ghost. She's a brand new person right now. No matter what she had or what she brought into the water, she's brand new in the name of Jesus. And we just thank you for her, God. Thank you, Lord. As you feel her so full, God. Fill her full of your presence, fill her full of your spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Just make her into the woman, the wife, and the mama that you've designed her to be, God. She's going to be a mighty mama, a mighty woman, and a mighty wife because of the Holy Spirit. I just thank you for that. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, good night. Food pantry's open, so see you guys tomorrow at 5, if not, not earlier. So.